On this edition of Primetime Politics, Ontario Premier Doug Ford calls on the Trudeau government to impose a mandatory three-day hotel quarantine for those arriving in Canada by the land border. Prime Minister Trudeau says he sees no need for a change. We'll talk to the head of Ontario's science table about the proposal and whether it would make Canadians any safer. Alberta, after leading the country in infection rates for weeks, on Thursday shattered all its previous records for new cases in a single day. We'll hear from a public health physician about Premier Kenny's latest measures and whether they can stem the tide. And our journalist panel will be in to talk about the latest pandemic developments and the Trudeau government's response to sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces. But we start with the push by the Ontario Premier to get Ottawa to tighten public health restrictions at Canada's land border. In the last two weeks, 150,000 people came through our land borders in Canada. 36,000 a month are coming through the, air, uh, the airports. All I'm asking, and it's not a criticism, it's work with us. We need tougher restrictions. It's not just about uh, the foreign students coming here. It's about having two sets of rules that the federal government's put down. There's one set of rule if you fly in and you have to quarantine in a hotel. And by the way, people aren't doing that. Just, to, uh, you know, let you in on that one. Um, or And going to one of the uh, land borders that people are driving up and, and getting out and walking across their border. I talked to a taxi driver the other day. They had 400 cars, uh, you know, down at the border picking people up. The system is broken. Ontario Premier Doug Ford speaking on Friday. Prime Minister Trudeau responded to Premier Ford's written request for action on the border. Here's his response. Anyone who comes to the U.S. land border has already been tested in the U.S. in the last three days. Then they have to get tested again. And everyone has to quarantine for two weeks and do another test on day eight. We're enforcing very severe consequences for anyone breaking these rules. To look at the latest in the pandemic, as well as the push for greater public health measures at Canada's borders, I'm joined now by Dr. Peter Uni. He is the science director of Ontario's Science Table. That is a group of scientists and public health experts who advise the Ontario government on its COVID-19 response. First of all, Dr. Uni, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, can I start with what has come up today and, and last night, and that is the, the Premier's request of the federal government that they do more uh, at Canada's borders and specifically monitoring, quarantining and testing at international travellers at the land border. In terms of this request of a three-day hotel quarantine for land crossings, where does, that fit all, where does that fit in in terms of what you're seeing in terms of infection? Well, look, it, it's it's a very difficult situation, and we, we probably need to learn a lot from other jurisdictions uh, that were successful, you know, in controlling their borders, actually. And uh, knowing that we can't generalize everything from places like Australia, for example, that don't have land borders. The point here is um, we need to make sure that we keep things under control as comes to new variants of concern or, or variants that could become concerning uh, once we look closer. Uh, we have currently many places in the world that are completely out of control, um, with, uh, with India, of course, with the entire Latin America. Tragedy is happening there right now. And we probably in the next few weeks need to find solutions that really make sure that we just can, uh, can um, move forward and have um, border controls reinforced, but feasible also for people. And on the other hand, also, you know, are able to take into account the vaccination status of people. This will be far mm -hmm. from trivial, but we are right now just moving very rapidly. How can we do something that is actually workable for people, but on this, at the same time really makes sure that people don't undermine quarantine uh, if it's needed and uh, that we understand um, that we only just have people released, you know, out of quarantine when uh, the, uh, the, the tests are clearly negative 
safe and when we have reassurance that uh, that there are no potential new variants actually just entering the country or the province. Okay. The Prime Minister today, with regards to the specific request by the Premier, uh, his request that this three-day quarantine hotel be extended to people crossing the border, the land border from Canada U.S., the Prime Minister basically said, look, these are people who have already been quarantined for at least two weeks in the U.S. They're people who have already had a PCR uh, negative test in the United States to be able to cross the border. He says he doesn't think the three-day hotel idea specifically would be of any, any benefit. No, we need to, to, you know, really just uh, consider how we handle that. The, uh, the, the, the issue with the three days uh, in a hotel is that it can be very challenging uh, for various reasons, including economic reasons as well. Are there any other possibilities? I'm not completely sure how to handle that right now. What, I, what I'm sure is we just shouldn't, you know, just... Uh, kick uh, the can down the road. We need to really just make sure that we understand how this can be handled. But vaccination status needs to be, you know, uh, taken into account and mm. obviously uh, previous test results. Has the science table ever made a recommendation to the premier uh, or to the government on the issue of uh, border controls and vaccine and uh, testing at the border? Um, we certainly have discussed this uh, once or twice at the health coordination table, but uh, I'm sure there weren't any firm recommendations. Okay. It is a complex, uh, uh, challenging topic, actually. Okay. I want to talk about the larger issue in Ontario, as you know well. Uh, the latest modelling came out yesterday. Uh, it suggests that Ontario hospitals, which are already at overcapacity and which are shipping patients around the province, that the hospitals still have more dire days to come. Can you speak to that? Is that your reading of the situation? Yeah, we need to be aware of that. Luckily, we were able um, to reach the peak in terms of uh, daily case counts, but this doesn't mean anything yet as comes to hospitalizations, hospital occupancy, and especially ICU occupancy. Um, we may now just about approach the maximum of uh, for ICU occupancy. If this is the case, this will go for weeks and weeks until we slowly start to see a decrease, and the numbers are really, really precarious. Areas. We need to be aware of that. In addition, you know, one of the other challenges is not every single public health unit in the province actually has reacted already. Peel has not reached its peak yet. It flattens now, but we have really tremendously difficult situations. Some people mentioned that the modeling, and you alluded to it, uh, that the numbers in ICUs, in on ventilators, the people in uh, in serious medical treatment uh, are not going to go not going to go down. Can the system sustain that for people? Are, I mean, doctors are talking about people being in ICU for a month, a month and a half. It is a real challenge, and uh, and you know. We, we don't have much choice as a, as, a, as a system. And, you know, and then again, also just to keep in mind, I'm not an ICU doc, but what I see, what my uh, colleagues actually are just are trying to do is really to find the, the best possible solutions in uh, in this situation. You know, I'm glad that we made, we make it probably below an ICU occupancy of 1,000 beds. But uh, we're far away, you know, from from, you know, just having even a first um, signal of things getting slightly easier. We perhaps have avoided, you know, the worst of all disasters here, but it's extremely precarious. And this will be challenging also, you know, just from a perspective of, uh, of, uh, of the staff. People are exhausted. People are burning out. And uh, we don't have uh, all the qualified staff that would be needed, you know, to uh, to keep this sustainable. And, and uh, I know that my colleagues will continue to try as hard as and uh, as well as they can, but it will be challenging. Okay, I want to ask you something. Uh, this week we had some good news, uh, according to many people, in terms of the paid sick leave announced by the uh, province. Legislation ma made its way through uh, Queen's Park quickly. That uh, whether you find it the optimum type of sick leave or not is one question. But again, in the modeling from your science table, you again stress uh, in yesterday's report that the uh, work mobility is still a problem. You see, basically, too many people going to work. You're again repeating your call that Ontario has to redefine the list of essential places of work. Do you think the Ontario government will ever revisit that and ever redefine what is an essential workplace? Well, I can't give you an answer. Of course, I hope so. First of all, we need to just be very clear. If we talk about paid sick leave, a program that doesn't give essential workers the guarantee that they just can call in 
and everything is being looked after for the next two weeks mm -hmm. will probably not be efficient in a, in a contributing to a control of the pandemic. So okay. that's one challenge. The other challenge is indeed we just need to make sure that we have this distinction between what is really essential and what is not. Again, remember the situation in Peel. It's extremely precarious there right now. And uh, we, we would need these sorts of shortlists. I can't possibly give you an answer what the, the government will do, but we believe these two aspects, the paid sick leave that actually works for people so they, that they stay home, plus a uh, distinction between essential and non-essential work would be extremely, extremely important. Okay, I just want to take you up on one thing I think you sort of, you seem to have suggested. You said paid sick leave will only work if someone can call in and know they can stay home for two weeks. This system that's been introduced this week is that you'll have three days of provincial sick leave, which you can call in for, but there's still an application to get to the federal leave. Do you think the system will work as you're seeing it? No, no. It won't. You know, the proof of concept has been the federal system in it on its own. It didn't work at all. If you place the administrative burden on people in these situations, you know, um, it, it won't work simply. They will not have the guarantee. The money comes too late, you know, in the process. That's for people who actually, you know, have a migration background in many situations. They live really from paycheck to paycheck and they need a simple situation that works. Otherwise, people simply won't speak up. And, you know, I've just been in a, a, on a site visit in a, in a meatpacking plant, you know, a few days ago. Looking into what goes on there, if you just see the, the, the circumstances, it's completely clear. If somebody doesn't have the opportunity to stay home when they are symptomatic, if the, if the virus is being introduced in such a setting, this will spread like wildfire. So we need to find a solution if we want to uh, control the pandemic. This is about both. It's about supporting those who need it most, but it's also supporting everybody eventually because it will be much cheaper, much much more economic if we can open up slowly and just make sure that people can stay home when they need to. Okay, Dr. Peter Uni, I want to thank you very much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. As Ontario's hospitals are at overcapacity and struggle with the onslaught of the seriously ill uh, COVID patients, Alberta, uh, Albertans are deeply concerned that their health care system may be headed towards the same fate. For several weeks now, Alberta has had by far the highest per capita infection rates in Canada. On Thursday, the province shattered its previous one-day record for new cases with more than 2,048 new infections. Also on Thursday, Premier Jason Kenney announced new, stricter public health measures to try to deal with the surge in cases. But some Albertans are wondering if the measures will be enough. Joining me now is Dr. Jahu. He is a public health physician in Calgary. Dr. Hu, first of all, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Uh, I guess I have to start. We, we see figures here. We see statistics. But I'm just, I, I, I'd ask you what you make of those st statistics that you're seeing now. How bad is the situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're obviously pretty bad. We did sort of see our one day case, uh, a new case count um, reach a, a record high. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, I do sort of follow, we do follow what's happening in Ontario quite closely. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, what really can hurt the healthcare systems when the ICUs get overloaded. And, you know, I don't think we're as bad as Ontario is yet, but ICU cases are sort of a, a lagging indicator that takes about four weeks to sort of show itself after a certain case count. And, you know, it is very concerning. Um, and, and so uh, measures, I guess, were in place to try to respond to that very recently. I was going to ask that because, I mean, I, I've been, uh, I host a lot of press conferences from public health officials and I've been watching the statistics in Alberta. And I think we've all been asking ourselves in Ontario, when we see per capita so much higher than in Ontario, how long that lag time is. Is there any doubt in your mind that intensive care admissions and even the number of people on ventilators is going to go up precipitously with the kind of rates you've been seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think they'll definitely go up. I mean, really, it's... Um it's sort of you, you see the ICU numbers and the hospital missions go up, let's say, two to four weeks after a particular sort of, you know, after the cases go up mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of how precipitously. I mean, I do think that many times during the pandemic, Alberta has actually had the highest per capita case count. You know, our, our numbers are not much higher than they were in our sort of second wave peak where we hit 18, 1900 new cases a day. Um, and, and so because of that, I think, you know, the health system government is taking some action. I do think one of the advantages Alberta has 
um, versus Ontario is sort of the, the unified health system by Alberta Health Services um, can probably cope with a few more ICU cases. I mean, y- y- it's a lot easier to sort of move patients around and there's a bit more coordination when you have a single health system. And, and that'll be at least something that we have uh, to our advantage. Okay. Jason Kenney uh, mentioned, uh, and we were watching last night, announced new measures and targeting certain hardest hit cities. He's targeted, there's sort of a, a cutoff point, but he's targeted certain cities. I mean, I'm going down the list, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, obviously Wood Buffalo Regional Municipality, which is, uh, is Fort McMurray in the area, uh, Lethbridge, Grand Prairie. But they're just certain cities. It's not a blanket across the board, shutdown, lockdown, and, and pr- increased measures. Is that going to be enough? Yeah, I mean, I I think that given that this is the first time we're introducing higher level measures, I think it's a good approach, right? I mean, I think across Ontario, there are also at various points, different type of hotspot measures, gray zones in the GTA, for example. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that's always sort of hard to predict is, is is human behavior. You know, at the end of the day, most transmission is still driven by what I call private indoor social gatherings, and those have not been allowed um, for, for many, many months. And, you know, with these new measures, I think we attempt to sort of signal to people that, hey, you know, it is pretty bad. We don't want to get to a place where RSUs are truly overloaded and people who need care can't get it. Um, you know, I'm. it's hard to say what will happen in the future. Um, I, I will say, you know, after our second wave, when, you know, the first sort of set of lockdowns or in the midst of our second wave after the first sort of lockdowns were implemented, our case counts fell quite quickly after that. Um, surprisingly so, actually. And, you know, one can hope that happens this time. But I think, you know, what was done was sort of a, a good step, frankly. And I do think a regional approach tends to be a good one, you know, especially if there's a lot of variation in cases, depending on where you are. It's interesting. So could, in a way, ironically, I mean, uh, Premier Kenny has been having problem, problems largely with his rural caucus in terms of measures that have been announced. He's had a lot of political pushback from his fellow politicians and his MLAs. Uh, but you're also saying that there's an advantage in having adopting what many provinces have adopted, and that is a regional, agile, supple approach to, mm. to different regions. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and I think there's certainly political reasons to do that, but there's also general adherence reasons, right? I I think right now we see pandemic fatigue setting in across the entire country, right? And, Mm -hmm. you know, what you want to do is sort of have, you know, insofar as they're effective, targeted place, like targeted interventions that are more, we'll say, severe, where there's really, really high case counts. Um, you know, otherwise, if you're in places with few cases and, you know, you're asked to go into aggressive lockdowns, people say, like, why should I even do this? Um, and we're seeing plenty of that. You know, we've seen plenty of that all over the country because, you know, people are pretty tired 15 months into yeah. this thing. OK, last question. I know you, you've just expressed your, your loathe to predict the future. So I'll ask you a different mm-hmm. question then. And that is when we look at Alberta, I mean, it's no secret. It seems to be the jurisdiction with the most ardent and common uh, non-compliance. I mean, people just out and out rejecting public health measures. So last night, Premier Kenny again said, I'm not going to go further because if I go further, we run the real risk of people not obeying regulations. Yeah, uh, so is the question uh, like... So, what? It, yeah, what's it like to be in a jurisdiction like that as a public health uh, official? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, well, there are like... I, maybe like a higher proportion of like extreme sort of uh, like super spreader type behaviors here. It, it's a problem that, you know, we've seen all over the country. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, all we can do is sort of like implore the public to try to, you know, sort of abide by the rules. You know, I think information about sort of hospital and ICU overload, you know, things like that can sort of change the needle. The further restrictions will hopefully change the needle as well. Um, Right now, we just need people to, you know, certainly limit their social interactions, right? You know, like, don't meet people indoors at all and get vaccinated as quickly as possible. Um, I, I think that on a maybe optimistic note, you know, if we look to the United States and how they're faring, I mean, their cases have totally collapsed. And, you know, there are a couple months ahead of us yeah. in terms of the vaccination rollout. But I think, you know, Ontario is emerging, which means, uh, you know, what they did during the third wave worked pretty well. Uh, it worked well enough, I should say. Um, at least the cases are going down, and I hope the same will happen for Alberta. Okay. Well, on that note, on, on a hopeful note, I want to thank you very much uh, for speaking with us. You're welcome. 
Well, joining me now to look at the week in federal politics and the third wave of the pandemic are two journalists. Tonda McCharles is a parliamentary reporter for the Toronto Star, and Ian Bailey is a reporter with the Globe and Mail's Ottawa Bureau, and he writes the Globe's daily politics briefing newsletter. Both of you, thanks for joining us. Hey there. Hi, how are you doing? Okay, well, let's start with, I, I have to start with uh, a premier who was having interactions with Ottawa on two fronts this week, uh, Doug Ford. I mean, it's not a surprise. His uh, province is arguably in the worst state of affairs in the country in terms of an over, the, 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 the overrun hospital system. He's having, it, the province is having a really rough time of it. We saw him have uh, an interaction with Ottawa this, this week when he suggested that his paid provincial sick leave program would consist of Ottawa doubling its federal benefit. Uh, he got uh, he was rebuffed by federal finance minister Christopher Freeland, and then within a day he was announcing a provincial paid sick leave benefit. Uh, but then we saw him last night sending this letter to Ottawa asking for them to change their border controls and quarantine and all that. Um, what do you make of it, uh, Tonda? And apparently he had other asks, you know, suspend international students, uh, more strict measures at the border, uh, tests on domestic interprovincial flights and then the sick leave program. Look, Doug Ford has a lot of asks of the federal government. You notice you never hear them outright saying no. Uh, however, uh, they are very cool to most of his demands. Although um, today being Friday, he, uh, Justin Trudeau, appeared at least open to consider or look at the idea of suspending um, international yep. students. Uh, there wouldn't be a ton of international students arriving because I know that there's also still students um, studying from far off countries here. But there are, to the surprise of many people, international students exempted from the travel ban who can come in. And I'm, I'm hearing uh, actually that there are a number of students who are going directly into university residences, um, not in hotel quarantine, and uh, showing up with uh, and testing swabbing positive for COVID variants. So it's... Maybe it is really come to the premier's attention and, you know, it kind of went under the radar for quite a while. But look, on the other stuff, clearly Ottawa, though they're not saying no, they don't, they're not interested. They've yeah. told Ford, you can deal with um, domestic flights. You can do what the Atlantic bubble did, ban interprovincial travel, if you want to go that way. Mm -hmm. um, no, they're, they've punted that. Okay, yeah, Ian, uh, the Prime Minister made it fairly clear about the three-day quarantine applying to land border crossings. He had a, a very clear rationale where he said it's not necessary. These people have been in the States for two weeks. They've had quarantine in the States. They've been PCR tested in the States, et cetera, et cetera. What do you make, though, of, of the interaction, the, the Ontario federal interaction and the proposals? Well, it's hard to separate this interaction, sort of Doug Ford's assertiveness on these points from perhaps the troubles that the Ford government has had in, in recent weeks, um, apologies and such that have been made about the, the way the pandemic has been handled in the province. Mm -hmm. It seemed today that the Prime Minister gave uh, Premier Ford a kind of win, shall we say, on international students. And, and, and watching and the Premier, the Prime Minister, that is, seemed very um, patient, shall we say, with uh, Premier Ford. Mm -hmm. on, on his needs. I mean, that's, that's sort of what stood out for me watching the interaction today. As Tonda pointed out, you know, the, the Prime Minister drew a line in a number of areas, but he seemed to go out of his way in saying on this issue on international students, he'd be willing to do what he could. His office would be willing to step in and, and we'll sort of see where this goes from here. I want to ask you something because uh, you have a lot of contact with BC politics. Um, it's interesting how he was basically stared down in a way by, by the federal government when he suggested that no, just doubling their contribution to the federal benefit would be enough to fulfill his promise of a paid provincial sick benefit. And Christopher Freeland's staff basically said, no, 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 that's not sufficient. That's not what we would be doing. We're not in the business for that. Uh, in BC, John Horgan is, is said to be still smarting uh, about the fact that the federal government doesn't seem to be wanting to change its approach and is saying it's up to provinces to do paid sick leave. Yes. And Premier Horgan out here has said um, he may be smarting, but I guess perhaps like a the Ford government, he has said that the B.C. government will be announcing something in due course, something in the next few days that will sort of uh, act on this issue um, in a B.C. perspective, sort of move as Ontario has moved to deal with an issue that, that, that Premier Horgan has been talking about for quite some time. So it's going to be very interesting at this point, presumably next week you know, maybe late in the week or such, to hear where B.C. goes on this. We'll have another province, therefore, sort of uh, moving on this issue. Um, you know, it's, it's no surprise ahead. that, yeah, it's, just, there, it's no surprise that all of the provinces would love for the federal yeah. government to take it on. Um, but there are uh, 
legal and regulatory reasons why they don't get to mandate most employers in Canada who are provincially regulated. Yeah. Ottawa can't boss them around and say, you've got to keep your employees on. You can't fire them if they need some sick days off. You know, there are good reasons for the provinces to do that kind of regulation in their sphere. But the feds have the money. The provinces have the power. The provinces don't want to have to end up having mandated paid sick leave for all these employees during COVID and then have to claw it back or drop it post COVID. I mean, that's electoral. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Suicide. <laughs> yeah. You- is that roulette? Like that's yeah. yeah, that's ridiculous. It's a it's a bit in a way it's a bit reminiscent of the whole struggle over long term care, improving long term care wages and and essential workers' wages. There were some federal top ups to that, and then the provinces went ahead with some, but some of them have expired. Uh, a lot of the major support payments came from Ottawa, so I mean obviously the provinces would have loved to have seen paid sick leave coming from Ottawa. Yeah. So we've and, seen and these this cover- this back and forth Sorry, going go on through this. I'm sorry, we've seen this back and forth going on through this process, through this tragedy, through this pandemic, between the two levels of government sort of trying to decide where they're going to go. As accommodating as the Prime Minister was today, um, he drew a very firm line on sick leave, again, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of saying that it's really a provincial matter to deal with. I want to ask you about another big development this week, and that was the announcement yesterday by Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan that he's named former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arboul to head up an inquiry. We've been told it could take up to a year, maybe more, uh, to formulate regu- recommendations on what to do and how to create some sort of independent reporting mechanism for cases or allegations of uh, sexual misconduct in the armed forces, in the, in the Canadian forces. Um, Tonda, reactions? I'll try and keep in my simmering rage over this story. Um, Look, I think that this buys the government time. This has punted a whole bunch of questions off for a year. This prevented, the, the Prime Minister got exactly what he wanted today in a news conference, which was a whole bunch of questions about process and appointments and reports and when and if and what, but no, not directly um, challenged time and time again to deal with why hasn't his government enacted an external review that was recommended six years ago. What was it? Was it because they had a minister in charge who has both um, military and police experience who wasn't keen on an external review process? Whatever prevented them from putting an external review process in place from the get-go from six years ago when Madame Deschamps recommended it? So I, I don't buy it. I think this is all a bunch of process crap that allows the government to kick the, the, the question down the road, possibly past another election. And, um, you know, all respect to Madame Arbour, uh, good luck with it. Yeah. I mean, as many people have said, the people we have heard from in the media and people have known who are women in the Canadian forces, there's a whole generation of women in Canadian forces who are now, once again, just going to have to to grin and bear it where their 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 complaints, their allegations, their experiences are not are not being dealt with by an outside independent arbiter. Um, Ian, your your take on this. Well, this is very unfortunate for the victims of this harassment. It, it, It delays things for quite a long period of time, although I know. There was talk yesterday about some interim processes to sort of resolve the situation. Uh, Tonda raised the point, and, and what if there is an election this fall? Uh, perhaps this has been asked and answered, but where does this leave the work that Madame Arbour will do? Um, you know, what happens to that work and what happens to whether it's picked up and how it's picked up and such? It, it, it sounds like a political solution to a challenge that the government faced, and um, I, you know, I'm sure Madame Arbour will do an excellent job on this matter, but it, it's just very inexplicable that this is being done after um, uh, Madame Deschamps previously worked on this file. It's just just very, very strange. Um, a you lot know, of people. Yeah, go ahead, Tonda. Well, I was just going to say, you know, the government and uh, Madame Arbour are all both making the claim that, you know, she's got a broader mandate yeah. and she's guaranteed that her recommendations will be implemented. Fine and dandy. Um, however, I just want to point out, this isn't just about women alleging harassment or assault in the military. There are men, there are trans members of the forces that have suffered because of this toxic culture. And there is nothing stopping the government today from fixing that. Yeah. And also, I mean, the point made about point. racism as well. I mean, supposedly this was going to also address, you know, cases of, uh, of overt racism and, and bullying, things like that. Yeah. Well, listen, both of you, I want to thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank, thank you very much. much.
Have well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Martin Stringer on behalf of all of us here at CPAC. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.